All right, the Gospel of John, Jesus the God-Man. This is our last lesson in the series. For those of you who are watching this on video, this is the bonus lesson. In our last lesson, we completed the actual text of John. Today we're going to do a little review test and I want to just uh, give you an idea what the review test is like. If you remember your uh, exams in junior high, this kind of looks like it. The first question, match the correct word with the correct statement. So the words are on the right, there are 13 of those. You have less statements, so you can't kind of, you know, you have more words than statements, okay? Then number two, fill in the blanks with the correct word in the following sentences. That you have to just do from memory. And then number three on the back is simply true or false. So there'll be 30 answers, your total points, 30, just put in your score. All right, so I'm going to give you some time to do it. Go ahead and do it. Hey, there's no embarrassment. Nobody's going to ask you what your score is. Nobody, you don't hand in this sheet of paper. You know, if you completely blow it, that's fine. Just you and God know, all right? I don't know how he'll feel about it, but... You may not have finished, that's okay. You can finish it later. Match the correct word with the correct statement. First question, answer is Samaritans. Number three, B, the process of bringing people to Christ. Number four, personal evangelism. C, one of the men who buried Jesus is number 10, Joseph. D, the person Jesus appeared to first after His resurrection was? Number nine, Mary Magdalene. Number E, a Greek term referring to a ruler who was responsible for one quarter of a Roman province. Yes, a tetrarch, tetrarch, number two. F, the man who found Jesus innocent three times. Yeah, Pilate. Number one, G, the father-in-law of the ruling high priest when Jesus was tried. Annas, number five. H, the term used to describe Jesus' lengthy prayer on the night of His betrayal. The high priestly prayer. Number I, the condition required for the Holy Spirit's coming. Jesus' death, of course. And what Jesus and the apostles were doing the night of the betrayal. They were having the Passover meal. All right, any questions? We good on that? All right, next one. Fill in the blanks with the correct word in the following sentences. The subtitle of this study in the Gospel of John has been Jesus the, the God-man. B, the reoccurring themes in, the, in John's book were referred to as, anybody? Cycles of belief or disbelief. If you have a word that's like cycles, reoccurring or you know, cycles. C, Jesus provided proof of His divinity through His, you can have any one of these three or all three through his miracles or teachings through the ministry. D, the Lord's first miracle occurred at Cana, water to wine. E, John was from the northern part of Israel near the Sea of Galilee, some, or Tiberias, I'll accept that. F, Jesus often stayed with his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who lived in Bethany. Uh, G, blank was the ruling high priest at Jesus' trial, Caiaphas. The Bible records a total of 10. We mentioned 11. We found one, one was, you know, but if you had 10 or 11, that's correct. And Jesus promised the apostles that He would send them the, the Holy Spirit, the truth, who would lead them, excuse me, who would lead them to all truth. All right, circle these statements. Is true or false? These were the tricky ones. 
John was the son of a wealthy fisherman. True or false? True. Jesus' miracles were done to create respect for God in the people. True or false? How many say true? How many say false? False. Jesus' miracles were done to create what in God's people? Faith, Faith not respect. C, John is the only gospel writer to record all three of Jesus' appearances to the apostles after His resurrection. True or false? How many say true? How many say false? Ha, <laughs> cowards. It's true. D, the follow through of faith is obedience. True or false? Yeah, true, absolutely. E, John has carefully recorded all that Jesus said and did. True or false? Yeah, that was the tricky one. False, right? Yeah. Yeah. If everything were recorded, he says, there wouldn't be enough room, you know, but I've recorded some of it. There, that, was, that was one of the tricky ones. Jesus did not have to be baptized because he was the Son of God. False. Jesus' last public miracle was the feeding of the 5,000. True or false? False. Anybody know what the last miracle was? The last public miracle? Raising of Lazarus. Well, you could say his resurrection, of course, but the one that he, Lazarus would be the last one that he did. Uh, the beginning of John's gospel is usually referred to as the introduction. True or false? False. It's usually referred to as the prologue. The purpose of John's gospel is that his readers will respect Jesus. True or false? False. That they will believe. And of course, this is the best Bible class that you've ever had. We won't even, we won't even, that's not even up for discussion right there. I'll tell you right that. All right. I'm only going to ask one, one result. Did anybody get 30 out of 30? Anybody get 30 out of 30? All right. So no overachievers in this class, that's good. <laughs> We're happy about that. All right, so the last thing I want to do, we've got a, you know, 15, 20 minutes left, is I want to just summarize the whole thing once again, lock it into our minds. The Gospel of John, as I've tried to show you, has one main theme, and it is repeatedly presented in every single scene depicted by John. It's amazing. He says the same thing over and over and over and over again. From the opening verses in the prologue where he describes Jesus' position with God before the creation of man, to the post-resurrection appearances, John is continually presenting Jesus as the divine Son of God, both God and man. That's, he's, that's what he's doing all the time. So this is the entire point of his gospel, that Jesus Christ, by His miracles, by His ministry, by His resurrection, has proven that He is indeed divine. So if you're having a Bible study with someone, you know, the first thing, people wonder, what's the first objective that I have? You know, get people to church? Teach them that the church of Christ is the true biblical church? And I'm not saying it's not, of course. You know. But I mean, the first order of business in any Bible study that I ask someone is, what do you think about Jesus? Who is He? And depending on that answer will tell me where I'm going to go with this individual. If they say, well, I don't know, I, I hear that He's this or that. You know. I remember teaching a group of Chinese immigrants in Montreal, full of, a room full of Chinese immigrants. One, one of them was a member of the church and he had invited his friends from college and this and that. And I asked these, many, most of them were students and you know, so on and so forth, college students, smart guys, guys who were in their PhD programs, so on and so forth at McGill or other top universities in Montreal. And I asked them, who is Jesus? Silence. And finally one guy raised his hand, he said, Santa Claus? I was the only connection. These were not ignorant people. These were well-educated, probably in the top 
you know, layer of their society in China, because you have to be, if you have enough money to go, come to Canada to go to a Canadian university and pay $60,000 a semester or something like that to go to school, you've got the money, and yet, not a clue. It's like an empty blackboard, you know, uh, you know. Where do you start? Well, this is where, well, let me tell you who Jesus is. Let's start there. We can talk about what the church is and what your responsibility is and all that other thing, but first and foremost, we need to kind of come to some conclusion about what Jesus is. And that's why John is such a terrific gospel. Okay? Now, someone might say, well, isn't this the intention of the other gospel writers as well? You know, they want to show that Jesus is the Son of God. And the answer to that is that each gospel writer had a point of view and an audience target with his book, and John is not different. For example, uh, sorry. Matthew demonstrated that Jesus was the Messiah according to the prophets. That was the point of his book. This is why he refers so much to the Old Testament in his gospel. He keeps saying, as it was written, as it, Jesus did this, as it was written. He's talking to the Jews. He wanted to show, the Jews especially, that Jesus' miracles and ministry and resurrection were all done and they were all done in accordance to what the prophets said would happen when the Messiah would come. That was the point of Matthew's gospel. Mark's gospel is the eyewitness account of Peter the Apostle. You know, we read Peter's words in the book of Mark because Mark was Peter's secretary. He wrote what Peter saw. Mark's work focuses on Jesus' power recording more of Jesus' miracles than any other of the gospel writers. The point to anyone who read was that the kingdom of God had come and it had come with awesome power. You want to talk about miracles? Go to the book of Mark. Luke wrote his work from an historical perspective. He tells the same story but Luke is very careful to include details that will fix the incidents of Jesus' ministry in a proper historical framework. Just like Matthew made sure to refer to the Old Testament prophets you know, to balance out, this is what the prophets said that the Messiah would do, this is what Jesus did to fulfill that prophecy. Well, Luke is talking now to an audience who would be thinking about history. Is this just a fantasy? Is this just like magic? Is this some sort of you know, a myth? Will Jesus, the story of Jesus, simply become a fable? So one of Luke's main objectives is to center the story of Jesus, the gospel story, to center it in, his, in history. When Jesus did this, this person was on the throne. This person was the tetrarch of this particular province, and so on and so forth. Okay? You know, in the first century, Luke's work of his gospel and the book of Acts was actually considered one book. It was circulated as one, as one book. All right? Now, in comparison to these, John is the only writer who directly engages the reader. His gospel is up close and personal. From the beginning to the end, he focuses not only on Jesus' miracles and teachings and ministry, he also focuses on how people react to these things. So if, if John's gospel were a movie, you would have a, you would have a lot of close-up shots of people, how they reacted, how they faced, what they said, what they were feeling at the time. Because John describes how men and women, how people who were rich or poor, how Jews, how Romans, how the high priest and even common beggars and fishermen, how all of these people reacted to Jesus. And John leaves no room for compromise. People are either seen as believing in Jesus or rejecting Him. One or the other. There's no you know, ambiguity in his, in his writing. And in the end, after countless examples of faith or disbelief, here's the punchline, he leaves the reader asking himself, do I believe 
or disbelief. So he's not just getting up close and personal with all the individuals in the stories that he's telling, I mean the, the eyewitness accounts that he's telling, he's also bringing this to the reader. He's getting into the reader's face and says, what about you, reader? Draws you in. And so after reading John's gospel, there's little doubt as to his point, that Jesus is divine or to his purpose, making everybody choose whether to believe or to disbelieve. Well, our time with this book is over for now. And of course, I hope you've gained some insight, a little more solid with the book of John. I also hope that your faith has been strengthened as we've studied the lives and responses of other people like you and I. These are ordinary people who believed in Jesus. And I also hope that you'll remember these last few lessons from John as we close out our study. So a couple of just take home Take home lessons, okay? A couple of takeaways. Lesson number one. This gospel is for us today. It's easier to detach ourselves from the other gospel writers saying that, well, the one who wrote for the Jews, you know, Matthew wrote for the Jews, and it's easier to say, well, I'm not a Jew. And one of them wrote as an eyewitness, and you can say, well, I wasn't there. And one of them who wrote for history's sake, and you can say, well, I'm not into history. But John had his eye clearly on every person who would read his book then as well as now. So there's no escaping the fact that if you read this book, you are compelled to render a decision whether you like it or not. That's, how, that's why he's really in your face with his book. You know, I used to say that if I was working with a non-Christian, I would read Mark to him first because it's easy, it's short and to the point. But after studying John, I understand why so many people choose this gospel to begin teaching other people. It's the one that asks the reader to decide whether they're going to be included with the believers and unbelievers. Kind of at the very end, the dangling question is, well, what about you, reader? Where are you at? So let's remember that this gospel is for us today. And should you have the great blessing and privilege to talk to someone about Jesus or have the opportunity to study with someone about Jesus. Don't worry about, well, I don't know all the theology and oh man, I couldn't remember exactly where this is in the Bible and the, you know, there are all 10 excuses why not to study with someone. I say to you, if someone in some way or shape or form, you have an opportunity to study with someone, just say, hey, how about we read the book of John together? <laughs> and that's all you have to do. Just get them to read the book of John. And you read, they read, you read. Let the questions come from the reading. And you see, the questions will come. Number two, let's remember that Christianity is about Jesus. You know, we get wrapped up in issues and programs, systems, projects, budgets, debates. I remember once I was speaking at a lectureship and my speak, you know, you know how it, it works at lectures, you know, they, they have four or five different speakers speaking at the same time in different venues. You know? And my speech was about evangelism, about use, the use of the media to win souls in the world. And next door to me, there was someone else uh, who was speaking about the issue of instrumental music, whether we should use it or not. And I had four people in my room and there were 140 people in the other room. What does that tell you? Now, of course, you know, I, I can make a very strong argument from the Bible that we ought to not use instruments of music in public worship. I can make that argument. But brothers and sisters, we've made that argument a million times to one another, come on. People are not converted because of our position on public worship. People are converted when they hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That's when people are converted. The rest we teach them, right? The rest we teach them. We teach them as we go. We bring them into the knowledge of everything. We, teach, we give them the whole counsel of God, how they should act, you know, what their priorities should be, spiritual development, public worship, the role of women and men in the church. And so you know, all these things are important things. But there's no use teaching those things if we don't, first of all, teaching who is Jesus Christ and what has He done for you? Okay? So Christianity is about Jesus. 
And more than anything else, John's gospel brings us back to the basics of our religion, and that's the person of Jesus. You know, on Bible Talk, I got an interesting letter from California. A guy uh, wrote me and he says, we're, I, we go to a non-denominational church, and we're a group here in California, in Northern California, but we need additional teaching throughout the week when we gather and so on and so forth, and we've stumbled across Bible Talk. And we enjoy the teaching, but we just want to know if you are sound as a teacher, could you give me you know, your, your creed? So first of all, I found it interesting that he found us, they were looking for Bible teaching. And so they typed in Bible teaching, free Bible teaching. Well, if you type that in to Google, the very first name you're going to get is BibleTalk.tv. We're number one on Google for free Bible media. Then he wanted to know, are we sound? Am I sound? You can't just tell that from the sermon titles or the series. So I referred him to the book of Acts. I told him, you know, you're like the Bereans in the book of Acts who were more noble. You know, they studied the scriptures to make sure what Paul said. And you know what I told him as far as our creed was concerned? I said, let me give you some of the basics. First of all, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Secondly, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, fully God, fully man. Thirdly, we believe that the only way to heaven, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there's no name under heaven by which we can be saved by Him. And finally, that we're saved through a process of faith and not works, and that faith expressed in repentance and baptism. Period. And I told him, you know, on issues and doctrines and points of view in our congregations, in our, in our churches, people have different points of view on things. And we allow that because we believe that the Bible the Bible itself has no flaws. It's completely given by God. However, what I say about the Bible, well, there might be a mistake there. Why? Because I'm human. So keep studying. Keep studying, keep referring to the Bible. So my point in that story is, my reference to him was, what we're about is about lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. That's the basis, that's the, that's the bedrock of our faith. Everything else about our faith, our practice, begins and ends with this one basic truth. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So when we begin having personal or corporate problems as individual Christians or congregations, we need to go back to this fundamental truth that John puts forth. We need to think about it. We need to reaffirm our faith in it. We need to focus our attention on it in worship. We need to reteach it before looking elsewhere for solutions. And then finally, remember that the best is yet to come. Note that for all those who said yes to Jesus, there was a reward given and always beyond expectations. From the woman at the well who found a new purpose, to the blind man who found a new voice. Not just his sight he got back, a new voice, something to say. From Mary Magdalene who found her beloved teacher risen from the dead, to Peter, who found forgiveness and renewal in his ministry. All those who John describes as accepting as true were blessed for their faith. But Jesus speaks to all of us today when he says, blessed are they who have not seen, but have believed, John 20, 29. So like Thomas, all of you here and all of us here today, we have not seen, but Jesus addresses us directly. And you know what? This is the rare instance where God, in context, speaks directly to the present generation. Every other place in the Bible, or almost every other place, Jesus is speaking to the generation that He's talking to, Moses' generation, Jacob, so on and so forth, or He's talking about the future when the Messiah will come you know, through the prophets. But in John, Jesus, the divine Son of God, actually speaks to us, you and me, today by referring to those in the future who will believe. That's us, an amazing thing. So he, he bypasses John's commentary and he promises us that we too will receive a blessing if we believe. So let's weigh the evidence and let's not be doubting. Let's believe, let's continue to do so in order to receive the best gift yet to be given and that is fellowship with the Lord Jesus Himself. Imagine, 
Eternal fellowship with Jesus Himself, that's something to look forward to. A blessing certainly worth waiting for. So that's the end of our series. Thank you very much. Those of you who've been in this class, those of you who, are, who have managed to watch all 31 lessons, uh, we hope to see you next time.